welcome to Jump School. I'm your host, Hassan Ali, aka The Style Jumper. On this podcast, we'll be discussing how to jumpstart your mindset by dressing well, boost your style, confidence, and etiquette. I'll also be discussing things like mental and physical health, the power of creativity to rejuvenate your soul. The following is an excerpt from Instagram Live. Let's go. Hey, man, let's let's get it started. We'll, we'll just kind of talk about, let's start off with your day, how things going in the business, how, how is the new climate of being, uh, you know, of COVID and right. being not specifically interacting with your customer base face-to-face. What does that yeah. look like for you? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, I'm the COVID, or for us in the business, we're COVID clothiers now. So there you go. Uh, how do you, how do you sell a product when people are at home? You know, wearing uh, you know, you know, leisure activity, Lululemon, you know, basketball shorts. Yeah. Um, but really, you know, when this all first came down, you know, just like everybody else in most industries, you know, we 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 were affected, and I just took it upon myself to reach out to my clients, you know, via text, maybe you know, drop them a line, just say, hey, how's it going? Everybody healthy? Just, you know, that that's what's first and foremost. So just really keeping, you know, those things in perspective. Um, as I was shipping out some of my shipments, I had some of these STL hats that I had on one of my videos. I'm from St. Louis. So I had these STL hats that I was sending out to my clients just saying, hey, we're all in this together. Just sure. as a little gift um, and supporting the local um boutique here in town that they have amazing products. So it was kind of one of those things where, hey, I could help support another small business, but you know, you know, just throw something out just say, hey, let let's let's keep let's keep everything in perspective. And I always tell my clients, you know, without them, there's there's no tailored gents. So um yeah, so so where we are today, you know, actually phones ringing, people calling me back, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of wedding activity which doesn't stop. You know, people yeah. still to get married. Um, but now the business guys are coming back around and, you know, when this all hit, man, I, I told myself, you know, it's probably going to be different until August, September. So, mm-hmm. you know, as a business, you, you want to build a cash reserve, yep. you know, if, if you're fortunate enough to qualify for one of those programs, like the PPP loan, uh, apply for that. If you haven't been funded for that. So there, there's, there's means to obtain capital. Uh, but I've just kind of forecasted that okay, until September, October, you know, let's, let's just forecast that there's not going to be a lot of sales, but we're having them. But yeah, just that's good. Cash you, is everything, right? So man, it is. cash flow. It is. Man, and the fact that you, you're thinking about, you know, projections, but you're also thinking about your client being more connected to them from an emotional standpoint saying, hey, I'm there for you. If you have any questions, any needs that you, you may have, hey, I'm here. And those personal touches means a lot. Uh, but for those of of us who don't know who you are, yeah, Mr. Di- Daryl Tyler. Tell everyone what's your, you know, what's your origin story? Like, where did you, where do you come from? How'd you grow up? And let's yeah. get into it. Yeah. So uh, the, the quick background is um, I grew up in the Midwest, so St. Louis. You know, born, raised mostly, but I grew up in Illinois, which St. Louis in Missouri, and there's a sub community over. I actually live in Illinois, and I'm in my home now. Um, which is 20 minutes from downtown. So it's kind of a natural market, if you will. I moved over to the Illinois side in elementary school, and that's where I ended up graduating. Uh, You know, moved on, graduated high school, uh, went away to South Dakota of all places, cold as hell. South uh, Dakota? To redshirt basketball. Okay, okay. um, So I was was an athlete. So redshirted for my freshman year, found out it was too damn cold for me. So I uh, transferred back to Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, which is a it's a D1 school now, and that's where I graduated, uh, business major. Um, but while I was obtaining my degree, I started out in banking, hmm. and so here it is. This guy showing up to the interview. I had a full suit on. This is 2000, so it's okay. 20 years ago. Um, this is two, and I show up in a suit, and I remember the branch manager saying, "Wow, you're you're kind of overdressed for a teller position," and mm. I just said. You know, this is, this is just how we do it. I mean, if I'm going to show up for an interview, I'm giving you everything. I'm Absolutely. Not, you know, I'm not going to just come in a shirt and tie or I'm not going to come with a portfolio with questions. I'm not going to come prepared. It's, you know, it's it's all it's always all or nothing for me. Sure. So I showed up. I got the job on the spot and I just continued that. I always dressed the step, you know, ahead of like where some other peers would because they they had the mentality. That it's just a teller position. 
-hmm. And I'm like, it's a teleposition. That's a stair step to a personal banker. And yeah. then the personal banker, I do a great job at a stair step to a retail. So I always had it in mind, you have to do the job great before you ask for a promotion. For but sure. I said, I'm a master that job. I'm going to be one of the best to do it humbly. But then if, if I see the next step and I think I'm qualified, I'm going to go for it. Yeah. And so that's really, uh, that's really kind of the story of just dressing professionally. And I just see, I just saw how that, you know, as an African-American man in the Midwest, there's not a lot of uh, black bankers, commercial bankers. And so I found out early on that dressing like you're supposed to be at the table uh, paid dividends for me because I have yes. a bit of the doubt. And so that's, that's kind of my background. So I started buying custom uh, about eight years into my banking career from a company called Tom James. They're in a lot of markets around here. Okay, yeah. And at the time, I was just trying to satisfy, I'm six, almost 6'4", six, 190 now. It's probably like 170 back then. Soaking wet with cowboy boots. Paper on. thin, paper thin. Yeah, paper thin. I'm blowing me, man. I'm gone. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, for me, it was just finding a shirt that could fit. So I bought a couple shirts. I was just happy that they fit better than what I was buying off the rack. Fast forward, I saved up. I said, I need to get a custom suit. You know, again, that closing suit, that big business meeting suit. So I bought a suit and then saved up more. So I would just continue to invest in my wardrobe every year with bonuses and stuff like that. And, you know, so that was 2007, 2008. Fast forward about four or five years, I was uh, buying from another clothier and they approached me and said, hey, I know you're a banker, but have you ever thought about doing this part time? And I'm like, no, I mean, I just... I like, the, I like to dress nice and this and that, but I, I've never thought about that. But I, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. So, yeah. you know, it, when she pitched it to me the first time, I was good. She pitched it to me again about a year later. And I said, you know what? I was comfortable in my job. I said, why not? You know, I can get, you know, I obviously get discounts, but I could sell to my banking friends, some of the business clientele that I have. And just, it was a hobby, man, just to, just to save a few bucks. Yeah. So fast forward about two years, man, I grew up a nice book of business. I'm learning a lot. Went to Chicago to learn how to measure and do all of that. Um, and then within three years of that company, I was like a top 10 male stylist. Uh, there was about 2,500 stylists, which were mostly women. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was about four or 500 guys. So, you know, I was one of the top 10 guys doing it part time. And that's when I decided, this is 2015. I'm like, you know what? I got something here. I have a book of business. I have the connections, you know, but I want to be in control of you know, more of the vertical process. I want to have more say on where my stuff's made, how, you know, how it's made, the models. I want to say, this is the lapel I want. I want a high gorge, you know, 3.75. You know, I want to style my garments that reflect, you know, me and kind of my style palette. Mm -hmm. And so I started trying out different factories. And that took about 18 months. It took money, right? Because you had to, had to order it. You know, I'd see how long it took. I had to check out the quality. And then I had to order, if I liked the fact that I had to order multiple times because I wanted to check consistency. Because there was times I ordered something like, man, I like this. I'm going to go with them. Yeah. And I order another jacket. And, you know, the button placement off, man, it's just crazy. So, you know, that took about 18 months. And finally, I solidified my relationship for my main garment manufacturer, uh, my shirt, my shirt house, and then uh, my first uh, shoe manufacturer. So, and it's tough, man. When I did have the sales reports that showed that I was selling. But when you're new to the business, you know, a lot of people, they're not going to give you a shot. The vendors, the fabric, yeah. the fabric vendors, the wholesalers, you know, the manufacturers, they're like, who's this guy? You know, yeah. he can dress a little bit, but, you know, is he selling anything? So, yeah. you know, that, that, took, that took some phone calls of just having some friends, you know, phone in a favor for me. And then, you know, so that, that's how I started, man. I never forgot those phone calls that were made on my behalf and, you know, I never overpromised when I did get a call back from a dealer or yeah. me, from a, a vendor. Okay. You know, I, I didn't want cloth from all these different, you know, mill. I didn't need that. I just needed a few because I wanted to sell and fulfill my commitment. Yeah, I didn't and be consistent. Exactly. Yeah. I want to send numbers through a couple of different, instead of having 10 and you're only doing a little bit at a time. Yeah. Reputation, right? So, Absolutely. so yeah, so that was a uh, summer of 2016 and, um, I had a little office at the time, probably 10 by 15, 12 by 17, something like that in our financial district. So I would just meet guys there. We do the fittings. It was a nice central location. And um, yeah, I opened my, I got a showroom now. It's about a thousand square foot uh, storefront right on the corner of our financial district now. And it's been great, man. It's, it's night and day, you know, when a client walks in and many times you have a client with their spouse, 
or they're bringing a parent. You'll be surprised he wants to come, you know, yeah. just kind of see it. They're curious, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so it's nice where you got, you know, a nice couch. I can pour them, you know, a nice thing of scotch. You know, I can give the parents a Diet Coke. I got the game on. You know, I really try to put them in their element, you know, even down to the music. I, I like when I – because whenever someone makes an appointment, I have to call and just – we do kind of a, just a, a get-to-know call. You know, I need to know what you're looking for, where you shop, just kind of – Give me a foundation, and then before I hang up the phone, like you know, what's your what's your favorite genre of music? Yeah, man, if it's classical rock, I got that plan when they walk in. If it's if it's, if it's old school hip hop, I'm I'm an equal opportunity, you know, uh, you know, host, if you will. So it just yeah. you just really want them to get in that element and be comfortable because most of my clients, it's, it's important their first to set time. the environment, right? Yeah, it's their first time there, but it's, it's also their first important. time custom too. Okay, okay. In St. Louis, you know, we're not a big market, so. 90% of the guys that I have first interaction with, they've never bought custom before. Uh, whatever version of custom. I know there's a lot of definitions of that. Yeah. But you know what I mean? It's their first time. So I wanted to go into that. There's a couple of things I wanted to, to speak on is, you know, first, I found over the years, there's, there's, um, got the kids, you know? Hey, man, I, I got them. You look, saw that look, didn't you? <laughs> yep. But this, you know, you know, man, this is what I love about it. Like, this is real life. Yeah. You know what I mean? And right. so we can't, we can hide, we can run, but we can't hide from our right, kids right. and our family. So um, one of the things that I was really curious about is what I've found is that there's quite a few um, people who've entered into the industry of custom clothiers being in finance. What, what do yeah. you see um, is the connection point between finance and, and getting into this game? Like, I mean, obviously you're, you're meeting people, you're dressing well constantly, but what do you feel is, that connection point. I think that those are some of the things you hit the nail on the head. You know, we've been a conduit to business. You know, if you're a banker, a financial advisor, you know, um, those are the two, two of the main ones I see that kind of convert into a clothier at some point, you know, that industry, because we're always in front of guys with suits or that dress up or we're the ones dressing up. So we have purpose to want to invest in how we look. Yeah. So that's why most guys in my business, you know, my, my best clients are financial advisors, you know, attorneys. Those are like your core folks that are going to wear suits. And then we kind of trickle down to sport coats and then get more into their after five or we get into their Friday night dinner with their spouse. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so we kind of tear it as far as like, who is your best, the best opportunity for the guy that's going to shop the most out of their closet? You know, a doctor is great. But during the day, most of them wear scrubs. Yep. So that's going to be an after five. He wants to look nice when he takes his spice to that nice Italian restaurant down, you know, in your financial history. Yeah. So he's got more of a social calendar and a social interest. So for me, I try to start with who needs it during the day. And then they need it at, after work, you know, and then they need it on the weekend. And that's kind of like my core. And then you kind of tear it down from there. So that's why you see a lot of guys that are in finance or banking, um, Number one, we've just come across business people all the time. So that, that's why it was such an easier transition for me to get into the business because I was always in front of people with suits on. Yeah. And I was wearing it. And they'd be like, well, where'd you get your stuff from? And yeah. Like, well, I had to, you know, I got it down the street or I got it from my lady. And that's what made me want to say, you know what, let me do that, you know, because I'm, I'm giving away business when I could be building a business. For sure. Well, mm -hmm. in, in the industry itself, because I wanted to kind of break this down based on industry, your personal style, and then going into a couple other things. But from an industry standpoint, what are some of the the critical, you know, failure points of, of custom clothiers? Like, what are some of the challenges, you know, and advantages of being a custom clothier compared to, you know, you know, someone who just works at, a, a, you know, a, a Macy's or a Nordstrom, you know, custom. There's something very unique about being a custom clothier, and especially in the past, I would say, decade and hyper in the last five years, there's a lot of people getting into the industry. You know, so so what are some of them pitfall, those pitfalls that people may come across? And, and what would you suggest, you know, to kind of open up the curtains, if you will, to what that yeah. world is like? So this is the fastest growing segment within menswear is, is the custom side of the house. So, you know, we found that even though, you know, they say it's getting more lax in, in business settings, um, you know, my clients are usually the decision makers, the C-level executives that, you know, they're not going to be working from home post COVID. You know, they're, they're, they're going to be making decisions and they're not going to need to look like they make decisions. So, you know, most clothiers in my position are dealing with like entry level. Not that that's a bad thing, but, you know, 
when you're offering a luxury product, you gotta, you gotta really define what's your di target audience. And, you know, if you're open to price points, a thousand, twelve hundred, depends on the market, you know, that's not affordable for everyone. You know, I always say it's like a Mercedes, right? You know, Mercedes, they have a market, you know, they don't, yeah. they don't target Kia and Hyundai drivers, even though both of them will get you to work and A to exactly. B. Exactly. You know, a men's warehouse suit will get you there as well, but you got to know your, it's, it's more of a concierge service. So um, some of the pitfalls getting into this business is one, it's like any business, startup capital, even though the barrier entry is somewhat low, um, you know, getting access, access to some of the better factories is kind of the challenge. You know, I would say that. So they start with some of these other um, factories that are, you can find them online, they send you messages you know, kind of a lower end product, but you know what, it gets you in the game. Yeah. Um, but then I think some folks may struggle with how do I move up to another, you know, a, a nicer, better made product, you know, with a nicer factory. So that's one. I think one of the biggest things that's challenging to get in this business, knowing that we have to, we have to identify a target market that has to have um, expendable dollars and disposable income it's like starting as a financial advisor when you're 25. What do they tell you to start with? Friends, family, and then you start working out that circle, right? Yeah. And you just start working out that circle. And, you know, just, I know when I grew up, I, you know, I'm a middle-class family. You know, if I'm starting looking to accumulate wealth and say our opening, you know, for a financial advisor is 100,000 in assets, if I'm just starting with like friends and family and I'm 25 years old, that's challenging. Sure. You know, that's challenging. And I, and I think the same thing is for a 25 or 30 year old clothier who's trying to get into the business and they're only doing a two times markup and they're selling a suit for, you know, say they're getting their suit for, you know, 200 bucks and they're selling it for four or five, you know, number one, it's really hard to eat off of, of that margin. Number two, you're going to have remakes. You're going to have alterations. There's other overhead. And I think one of the biggest thing with like newer clothiers or clothiers who haven't established themselves is not valuing their time. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't value their time. You know, I spend an hour to an hour and a half with a first client, usually closer to an hour and a half. Um, it probably takes another hour or so to build out their pattern and submit it to our, you know, to our factory. And then, you know, there's delivery, there's unpackaging, there's, pre there's all these things to package and deliver, you know, and then I always, you know, set up an initial, a final fitting, you know, if that's what it takes or maybe two more. But I may have four hours, four or five hours into that deal. So, you know, I don't know what you make per hour, but if it's 25 an hour, if it's 50 an hour, if it's 100 an hour, you know, you need to tack that on along with your markup on your product, whether it's yeah. three times markup. And I think that's where, you know, a lot, even even myself in the beginning, you know, you price it to try to sell to build a book of business. And I think you should price your product based on your skill set. You know, how I fit guys four or five years ago is different than how I fit them today. Right. Yeah. So hopefully I'm better. Yeah. And but, you're a more mature male. Right. So your your yeah, perspective of style old. is different. Yeah. Once yeah. You I'm 40 years old, old, so, your body you know, going to change. Mindset's going to change. Exactly. So I think that that's so as a new clothing, some of the pitfalls are learning the business, man. You got to cut your teeth. You're going to you're going to mess up some garments, you know, because many of us didn't have anyone to shadow. You know, many of us kind of go out on our own because there are means to do that and just partner with a factory directly directly. They give you a little information on what measurements they need. But as far as like an ongoing dialogue of, hey, you know, I keep getting I keep getting jackets back and I got the puckering, the horizontal puckering on the sleeve head. Or, you know, I got twisting right here up to the collarbone, you know, on all my jackets or this or that. And it's just like they don't have anyone to talk to to kind of solve those posture problems. Mm -hmm. The people in my industry say, OK, yeah, you know, his, his, his shoulders are pitched forward or his arms are pitched back. That's making the jacket react in all these different ways. And so. It just takes that bats. Like they keep making stuff, and then finally they tweak something and say, you know what? All right, that fixes that. But you know, so it's it, usually it's your education is thing. usually on the mistakes of, of creating garments, especially when, you, when you're starting out. That's the best teacher. That's that's by far the best teacher. But you know, I've had guys in the industry that I've called. Uh, there was a gentleman that just joined, uh, Josh Breschko. Uh, that's my guy. He's out of he's out of. Uh, He's out of Detroit, Michigan, and okay. he's been doing it, I think, since 08, 09. What up, though? So he, okay. He's been in the business a long time. Um, and for him, you know, a lot of guys in my business, they won't post their clients. 
You know, they look real good, don't they? You know, their suits are nice and crisp, and you can't find a wrinkle on it. But you'll never see their clients. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But someone, you know, like Josh or even myself, I don't mind showing my product because as a consumer, yeah, I look great. I can make all the tweaks. And, you know, I may just have the body that no matter what I put on, it's probably going to look and drape just right. Sure. But, you know, where the rubber meets the road is, you know, what, what are your clients? Because clients come in all different shapes and sizes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you might be able to fit that 40, you know, that 40 chest, that average waist, you know, or everything's average. You know, whatever you got that, you know, that barrel chested, you know, 50 inch chest, you know, guy that's just his posture's all off. He's got a low shoulder, you know, he's got a flat butt, you know, all these little things that, you know, you have to accommodate for when you're creating this pattern. So, um, I follow guys like that. I call guys like that. I think you should have kind of your own network or even your own board of directors, even if it's not an official term, that you can kind of bounce business ideas. You know, I know Josh and I, we've had business discussions. We've had fitting discussions. Uh, you know, I got a handful of guys I think very highly of uh, that I just, you know, hey, we talk, man, and we just, we help each other. And, you know, we, we, you know, we clap each other's success. And, you know, and it's, it's good. It's a good community. Not everybody's like that. Yeah, but I think, you know, some people can kind of just feel it. And he's like, you know what? I think that's somebody I can have that conversation. And so it, I it's got really it. important. It's, it, you know, one of the things that, you know, over my years of, of being, you know, in sales and things of that nature, building those relationships and being able to lean on people who've already been where you're going is yeah. really important. And if you can have an honest conversation and not feel like you're asking a dumb question, if you will, and that person can give you insight and also educate you and not yep. feel intimidated. Sort of like, you know, Jordan and Kobe talking, right? Right. Regardless, Jordan is going to always be Jordan. And Kobe is trying to learn. And even, you know, in the last dance, Kobe was saying that, God rest his soul, that he learned so much yep. from Jordan. You know what I yep. mean? So Jordan, was, you have to be comfortable and confident in yourself as an individual to be willing and open to share what you know with others who are trying to get into the game. Cause there's enough out here for everyone. There's enough people and enough dollars and enough relationships that we all can eat. So it's really important yeah. that, you know, to your point that, that people be willing to open up, you know, and, and there's something that, that really piques my curiosity is there's this advent of the 200, $300 suit. And as a professional, how do you, what are the differences, you know, for those who don't know, and to your point of those who are walking through your boutique for the first time, they talk to a homeboy down the street, when they're right. guys who are selling online on Instagram and they have a three hundred dollar suit, what is that what is the difference and, and what, what to expect when, when when someone comes into your to your boutique? So I, I draw the comparison to uh Ponderosa. You can get a steak at Ponderosa, right? I mean yep. you can get a steak, you can get potatoes. You know, you can get macaroni and cheese, nice salad. Uh, but then you go to Ruth's Chris and you can get a steak there too, right? Yep. You can get a potato there. You can get a salad, a nice salad. The ingredients at the latter is usually better. It's a better cut of beef, typically, if you're steak. You know, the, the ingredients should be fresher. They should use a higher quality product yep. to hopefully deliver a higher, you know, quality product to you and, and there. And that's the way I look at, you know, nothing against a two or three hundred dollar suit if that's your market because again everybody can eat and you know what everybody's not going to be a five thousand dollar bespoke tailor and everybody's not going to be a suit supplier that can produce at the masses so you got to kind of find where your lane is yeah. um but there are makers out there where you can you know you can come up with a three or four hundred dollar suit and typically it's going to come down to you know the quality of the product you know which is the in inner workings the materials that make up that garment the cloth you know, the cloth may not be a full 100% wool. It could be a blend, which typically that blend is a little polyester, uh, which looks great in the beginning until you dry clean it and wear it a few times. You know, and then you start, it starts to show its wear. It starts to wear and it ages. It doesn't age very well like us, brother. You know, <laughs> you know. So, um, but you get what you pay for, right? Yeah. It's just like, like I say, a Hyundai Mercedes. A Hyundai is going to get you to work, you know, but it's not going to have the same motor performance. The leather's not going to be as nice, you know, and that's, so that's number one, the ingredients. Number two is usually the fit. You know, typically if you have better ingredients, you know, your shoulder style and construction is a little bit more forgiving. So when you put it on a guy, you know, it's I put I put garments on guys that are made from my factory without any tweaks. 
you know, mm -hmm. before, like during the fitting process. And they're like, damn, I can walk out in this because it, it's a higher quality, pro quality product out the gate, you know, before yeah. we even have to make any changes. So um, I think those are the two things you're paying for. And then lastly, you know, usually someone that's been in a business a long time that can fit guys well, you know, it's got a great style uh, platform. They're just going to demand a higher, a higher return, you know, so they're not going to $300 for a suit, including all their time. Those two just don't marry up. So um, that that's why you see that. And I, and I, and I would challenge you if you had a three or $400 suit and you see how it's on a guy and you have somebody in a $1,500 suit, you know, I, first thing I'm gonna look at is the fit. I'm gonna look and see how it fits, how it drapes on them. Uh, I'm gonna look at the cloth because all those things are, and you know, cause again, longevity, what does that suit look like 10 years from now? If it's yeah. a poly, if it's a poly blend, you know, cancel Christmas, man, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it looks great today, but give it a year. It's going to be, it's not going to look great. So, but there's a market for everybody. I don't, I don't beat up, you know, folks who want to shop at different places or men's warehouse or all I say is just don't, don't draw comparisons to it. You know, don't, don't say, well, I can get that same thing for 300 that you're charging 1500 for. Well, you know, once I explain what all we do and what all goes into it, you know, uh, we do whatever it takes to make it right. So whether it's alterations at delivery, whether if I just totally missed the mark and I got to remake it, I do it. I mean, there's there's no second guessing. Matter, you know, usually a guy come in and say it's a little uh, about a half inch too big in the coat waist, you know, first fitting or something like that. You know, he's like, man, he's so excited and it still fits him great. And, you know, he never a lot of times they don't even notice it. All I do is just start pinching the sides. And I'm like, look, just look how that contour is like, man, this, he said, I thought it looked great, but just a little tweak. And I'm like, just give me a day or two. And I just start pinning and just show him. And he's just yeah. like, well, damn. And I'm like, well, that's what you pay for. You know, I'm not going to let you walk awesome. out. I'm not going to let you walk out, even though it's, you didn't even notice it. But that's what I'm here for. That's why you paid me. Yeah. You know, even if it is a half break. inch or a pinch, you know, I'm going to do it. It's yeah. because when you, when you put that on, you see that contour and you see everything laying right you know, you're going to remember that. It's like in our business, we get guys that they deliver the first fitting and, oh, the sleeves are off or the coat is too baggy in the waist or the pants are too short. Many of them will say, all right, well, on the next one, we'll do this, 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 this. And that's just my pet peeve. You know what? That doesn't help anybody in the business, you yeah. know, because every time you put them pants on, they're too short. He's going to think about like, damn, I just spent $1,500 on a suit. And I need another half inch. I mean, how ridiculous does that sound? But it happens. Like, people don't want, you know, clothiers don't want to spend an extra 50 bucks to really make it right and really, you know, have an impactful relationship with somebody just to say, oh, well, next time. Well, you know, a lot of those clients walk into my showroom and be like, you know what? I had five jackets made, and they all had this huge collar roll, and all the sleeves are way too long, you know, mm. with functional buttons. And there's nothing they can do. And he said, we'll do it on the next one. And it I just... Works. And it's I just kind of look at them and I just say, you know, I don't really disparage any of my competitors, but I'll just say, you know what, we don't do it that way. You know, we're going to make it right no matter what. If we miss the mark on something, because it's custom, man. You, exactly. You know, shit happens. It really does. Yeah. I mean, some things, you know, I, I've been in the game a little while, but, you know, early on, you can overcook things. You can overfit people. Mm. You know, where you're trying to get it right to that little quarter inch. And you know what? It's just like, you know, an extra – Guys appreciate something being a little big more than they appreciate something being tight. There's a psychological reaction when a guy puts on, and I don't care if he put on the COVID-15, you know what I'm saying? That might be an exception. But, you know, <laughs> say he puts on some pants and the waist is too small. You know, it just, it does, it's just, and then he puts on the jacket and the jacket is too tight. You know, it's like, it just does something. Psych but if you put that jacket on, it buttons, he still has a contour. And all you got to do is just do a little pinning. Or if you pinch the back of those pants and you need to take them in a half inch. You know, I mess around. Man, you lost weight on me. You know, you, you've, been, you've been working out. You know, like, I just, and he's like, no, you know, I have been working out a little bit. You know, and it just, but their spirits are so much different than if everything's tight and short. Yeah. So, you know, if any clothes are listening and they're new, you know, always err on the side of caution of, you know, give yourself a little room, man. And set that expectation at that first delivery. Like, look, you know, I'm creating a pattern just for you from scratch. So my goal is to have a walkout fit, but I'm not perfect. There's no perfect body. I may have to tweak, you know, a, a trouser length. We may have to tweak and, you know, take in the coat a little, you know, I'm like, or maybe not, but 
what you do is you set that expectation. So when you do land it and you don't have any alteration, they're like, they're kind of looking like, I don't think I need anything. And I'm like, well, that's what we strive for. But, you know, again, this is custom. There's a lot of moving parts. But the and cool thing is that you, you're only, I mean, to cut you off, but, you know, you're not only still selling, but you, you're empowering, right? You're empowering that person. Hey, who is that? <laughs> this, is, this is my little buddy right here. This is Braxton. What's, What's up, up Braxton? Braxton? Say hi. What's <laughs> up, man? Give me some of that hair, man. Yeah, look at I don't that. have none. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's this up. my big boy. Watch there you go. Bro. Um, <laughs> but let me ask you this. As a parent, you know, how does it feel as a father, you know, to be able to, you know, be a entrepreneur and control, if you will, and direct your destiny and your path in life? How are you, you know, connecting those dots with your son? Does he like to come over to, you know, to the, you know, to the boutique? Are you guys having conversations? My, my oldest or my, my middle child, which my only son is 13. So okay. what is that like to, you know, what's that conversation like between you guys? And, and how, how does, how does is your son right now? Uh, yeah, so that's my five-year-old. And then I have a nine-year-old. Okay. And uh, my nine-year-old is a Virgo like me. So. Okay. He wears, you know, he doesn't wear any suits, obviously, but man, he has all his Nike stuff laid out, all all matching this down to the socks, the underwear, you know, depending on what kind of shoes he, I mean, it's like, it's, it's kind of scary. I look at him and I just, he comes out of his bedroom, he's got everything matching. I'm just like, oh God, I, I'm, I've created a monster. You but it's, it just on it. it's just yeah. in here. It on it. Watch out, Bubba. And, and he's just always been like that. And then this is my hard, this is my rough, this is my rough neck here. He, he can care less what he has on. <laughs> Watch that court. Um, yeah. So, you know, the nine-year-old, we, we just talk about, you know, trying to create, we just talk about, you know, not being afraid to be an entrepreneur, not being afraid to follow your passion, um, mm-hmm. you know, no matter what that is. But I, I think the biggest thing is just like, you got to work hard, man. No matter, mm-hmm. no matter what craft it is, you know, if you work for corporate America, you know, you have to you have to make your mark. You have to, you know, set you have to control the narrative of how people perceive you. And that's mm-hmm. why I think dressing is such a big thing. Um, you know, branding is part and how you show up every day is not just like work performance. It's the total package. It's, yeah. Does he look like he can do a good, good job? Does he look professional? Yep. You know, and so I talked to him about just kind of high level. You know, this is what you're going to have to be mindful of. But nothing's going to come, you know, if you don't work. You know, and so I even he's he's a really good soccer player. He he's like Mr. Sports, very athletic. But you know, even with this COVID, he's not playing as. But I would say, you know what? I'm a triathlete actually. So I, you know, I run, bike, and I used to swim. There's no pools open right now, but I still train six days a week. Nice. And I say, you know what? You know, if you want to be good at anything, man, you got to put the time in. You know, you got to put the work in. So you need, we got all the equipment. I got a full-size soccer goal right out this window. Nice. I'm like, y'all got everything. You just got to put the work in. So that's usually what I talk to them about. You know, I do take them to the showroom and they hang out with me. But it's really just about work ethic and um, being a good person, being a team player, staying humble. Yeah. You know, the humble thing's a big thing. Just, yeah. you know just like look yeah you're we're blessed man we're so fortunate i don't take any of it for granted but you know this could all be gone tomorrow and uh you know so just 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 appreciate what you have you know you don't you don't open a refrigerator and there's nothing in there you know it's for sure you know you don't know those days and that's what that's what his parents have tried to do so and i'm sure you have the same conversation a- absolutely absolutely man it's really interesting so who, who was your biggest influence growing up uh, my parents, my parents, yeah. man, they, they worked their ass off, you know, um, my dad, you know, he worked during the day. He always had a, he was very good with his hands. So whether it's funny, I was probably started in junior high, man, I would go and he was always in property management, managing different properties around St. Louis. And he would, you know, make relationships with tenants and things of that nature. And we, he said, Hey, we got a paint job this weekend. We're going to paint, you know, two condos. And here, you know, I'll pay you 500 bucks for the weekend. Like, it was great money, you know, back then, yeah, back in the for 80s. Sure. 80s, 90s, and early I, 90s? I never even questioned it. I was just like, cool. You know, I got my stuff on, man. And it was great bonding with my with my dad. He, he's still around. But it was great right. bonding. Like, you know, it's he and I. We go to this place. It's empty. We're going to get the paint at Home Depot. You know, we're, we're, we're getting everything. You know, and I'm learning all this stuff. You know, all right, you start in the back room. I start in the kitchen. I'll start trimming. You roll. You know, he's got the he's got the James Brown on. He's got the 
He's got the smooth <laughs> jazz on. You know, he's got the Frankie Beverly on. And, there you go. You know, we go Man. have lunch together. You know, it was just, yeah. you know, we did a lot of that when I was growing up. And uh, it wasn't so much about the money. It was just great just to, you know, be able to work with him. And, you know, and I think that's where I got a lot of my work ethic because even in college, man, I, I worked full time my last 30 or excuse me, my last six semesters. I worked full time and I uh, and I went to school full time. So mm -hmm. I had school all day, Tuesday, Thursday, and then I worked Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday for almost three years, man, straight. Didn't have a day off. It was crazy. Um, but I think that really helped build muscle memory into just mm -hmm. like working hard, man. Mm -hmm. So that's dope, man. Um when when was that day I, I was thinking about me and i think all of us guys you go through this scenario where you realize two things either you realize the importance of style or when you looked in the mirror it was like that boy kind of sexy you know what <laughs> <what> I mean? <laughs> oh. you remember that day like i, I mean i found a picture and it, and it snapped in my head this was recently where i realized that was the moment where i looked <laughs> in the mirror and i was like your boy kind of fresh. Oh man, it uh it was early. It was early. I look back at like fifth and sixth grade pictures where you know I was wearing my British Knights, man. It was coordinated oh, with my yeah, with my MC Hammer uh <laughs> you know pants to match. Like it was it was crazy. Um so it, it started back then and then in junior high, my dad used to buy those rayon shirts, I think, from uh famous which is Macy's now, but it, it was famous bar here in the market. And, you know, it was a button down. It was like a rayon or a silk. Yeah. And, man, I would buy those, man, tuck them in my Levi's, you know, with my with my Patrick Ewing's on or my, uh, you know, my high tech, you know, just that that all that that 1990s look, man. And so I, I started early. And then by the time I got to high school, you know, I was I was already dressing. And then college, it evolved, you know. So it's I think for me, it, it started really early on. Like I look at my nine year old and I'm like. You know, that, that's probably how I was, you know. Hmm. I can't wait to see him in high school. He's, you, know, uh. he's, you know, he's probably going to be a beast. So <laughs> Sounds uh, like he's already a little beast, man. He is a little beast, yeah. So it started there, man, and I just kind of – but, you know, it's my own style, man. I appreciate all the different types of style. I look at it as art, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what works for you may not work for me, but I still appreciate it and vice versa. And that, that's what I like about – that's what I like about style. I prefer style over fashion. Exactly. Just because, you know, style is, uh, that's the foundation of one's, you know, personal look. And yep. then, you know, you, it'll, it'll, it'll move and morph a little bit through the times, but you always got that foundation. You always got that base. And, that, and that's what I appreciate. And that's what I like. Um, you know, and fashion's good too. It's just what works for me is I like, and I like time and style that, you know, is very respected. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's just, that's what I like. That's what I go to. So how do you define, you know, you know, the modern traditionalist, the little research? Uh -huh. um, again, going back to I, I don't I don't like to be, you know, and I, you know, I'm here, you know, I'll do a little bit on the, you know, I, I'll get out of the box a little bit with certain colors and stuff like that. But I always try to stay here. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with uh, a James Bond look or. You know, Frank Lucas, South American gangster, where, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, don't have, it doesn't have to be a lot of flash or pop. And I do a lot of that just because it's great. I like it, but it's, excuse me, it's great marketing. You know, yeah. all I wore is solid Navy suits and solid gray suits. I mean, it's fine, but, you know, people like to see some variety. But, you know, just a modern twist to kind of that traditional look. You know, it's James Bond or Frank Lucas, you know, from the movie, but just kind of a modern with a modern twist, you know. A little thicker tie, you know. I like a little wider lapel, uh, you know. Kind of like the Italian influence, if you will, uh, especially with some of these peacock type jackets. You yeah, know, but I really like the British look on a lot of my suits lately. Just you know, do a little more structured shoulder. Yeah, uh, you know, I may add a ticket pocket, just everything straight. You know, I really. It's funny you go through ebbs and flows of your style, and I've, I'm I'm now more of a minimalist. Not doing a whole lot with the buttons, and you know, just trying to keep it a little bit more classic. Yeah. Um, so and I, yeah, and we all and go think, through that. I think that comes with age, right? You know, we that's we, probably it too. You know, we start thinking, okay, you can say a lot by being simple, right? You can you can be very you can project confidence without, you know, air quotes peacocking, if you will, you know, and yeah. if you're you're if you're knowledgeable, and you your posture is in a way where you carry yourself in that way where 
you're really comfortable in your skin, then what I'm finding is that even me at 46 this year is that winding back down to the simplistic things. And to your point, you know, um, Bond is someone that's, that's always timeless. You know, I don't care if you go from, you know, uh, Roger Moore, Sean Connery, all right. the guys who played that role, you probably only seen Bond in two or three different colors, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's it. And the fit was always on point, and he always yeah. looked great, and he and he looked very comfortable and con confident. Obviously, that's a part of the character, but that's one of the individuals that, that made me, when I was a kid, start looking at, that's something about the way this guy dresses. And again, I'm watching, you know, the cars, you know, first yeah. time, you know, you've seen an Aston Martin, you know what I it's mean? It's a lifestyle. It was a lifestyle. It was. And obviously the ladies, that, that kept me in the, you know, in the game yeah. of watching Bond. I'm a Bond. huge Bond fan, by the way. You know, me I'm too. a huge Bond fan. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Bond but you're right, Bond. man. It, you know, and I, and I, I draw a lot of, I draw a lot of those um, characteristics. I love talking about somebody like Bond just for my clients. I'm in St. Louis. It's more traditional. You, you know, guys don't, a lot of my clients don't venture out, especially in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And and even with the, the tuxedo game, like, I hardly ever throw a ticket pocket on a tuxedo. I don't, I don't do a lot to a tuxedo. And I always reference Bond because I say, you know, you know, the key is fit and just that classic timeless. I deal a lot, I deal a lot of grooms. And I just say, you know, don't mess, you know, let's not mess it up. Like, let's yeah. keep something classic. Like, yeah. you know, if you want to do some crazy buttons and stuff on a sport coat, that's different. But, you know, for your first tux that you're going to wear and you can wear for years to come, um, and I always say Bond. You know, look at Bond. You, you don't have to do a whole lot, man. It's, yeah. that, it's there. You got a nice quality fabric. Uh, you know, you know everything's complementing one another. It You'll stand out, trust me, you know. So, because we've all seen cheap tuxedos. And, <laughs> you know. So I, I, I love that look, like I said, you know, especially for my clients who are trying to kind of find their style or, you know, a lot of them coming to them like, you know, I kind of want to look like this. Or, yeah, they have you an know, idea. I, need, I need to step it up a notch, you know. That's yeah. What and the first thing I say is, you know, I don't want to sell them something that's going to make them uncomfortable. Like, yeah. I never try to put my style on them. Mm -hmm. You know, I ask a lot of questions. Then I say, hey, here's, here's a couple collections I think we can start from. Let's build from there. And, you know, and then they may say, hey, all right, let's, let's, you know, from that, let, let's pick a fancy lining or let's do that. And that's, but I'm like, I don't ever want you to go to your closet and, and see something you're like, damn, that's just, that's just so loud. I don't, I don't really? you know, it's 50, 50, you know, I want you to be like, every time you go to your closet, and you see Taylor Jen stuff, you're like, okay, that's my favorite stuff. I want to wear that. I want to wear it twice a week. I want to wear it three times a week. Cause I love it so much. Yeah. You know? no doubt. So, so there's a couple of questions I see here. So, um, Mr. Roberto Hoya, he was curious, have you, do you sew at all? Did you learn on your own? You just understand you're learning, you've learned over time construction and what looks and fits well is or, or more of your education and knowledge is on more of the, the fitting side of things and then everything is sent off uh, for construction. Yeah, every, like every just to answer the, the second question, everything, I have a factory partner, a couple factory partners. So, you know, we create the part, we create the pattern based on the measurement process, you know, based on posture, all of that. And then we send that off and then they, they construct the garments. Uh, I do not have a sewing background. You do not want me sewing on your garments. <laughs> uh, it'll be like Theo's shirt off of the Cosby. Oh, man, uh, not the Theo shirt. Yeah, not the yeah. Mustard, not the mustard shirt. Exactly. No, I got a, I got a seamstress. Uh, I have a seamstress and. So, no, I, I don't do any of that. You know, I, that's outsourced. I, you know, you don't want me doing that. Uh, I'm, I'm more of a sales guy. I'm the fitter. Um, you know, I'm curating the style. I'm trying to put together a plan, you know, for the client. So that's that's my specialty. I do understand patterns. Um, I actually got certified, you know, as a clothier out of New York, out of our trade association. So that was a, a couple-year process. And, you know, you took blue pencil class, you took business, you took uh, alterations, measuring. Um, and then after so many years, they, they, they certify you. So, and I've shadowed some folks, uh, Manuel Martinez. I had the pleasure out of Baton Rouge. That guy's a beast. He's been, he's been voted like one of the best clothiers. And he's, he was voted the top clothier in the world twice out of what? Italy. So what he had to do, so he's out of Baton Rouge. You guys don't know Manuel Martinez. Look him up. Um, Taking notes. I got I got to uh, I got to shadow him, and for about eight about six hours, and you know the guy, I mean, and 
He did what he did with two guys coming in in six hours. Most guys doing a month. Let's just really? put it like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, but man knows the stuff. You know, he went over to Italy twice, and they give you a model, and they say not only you have to fit them, but you have to style them, and mm -hmm. you're going to be judged by some of the world's best fashion folks. So it's presented to you know it's almost a runway style. Mm -hmm. You describe how you put the curated the look, how you put it together, and he's really good with color. Like mm -hmm. he taught it, he taught a class on style, and I remember um, not being arrogant, but just like you know, who's this guy's gonna teach style? Like, yeah, yeah, you know, it's just you know, it, it, yeah. So it is arrogance, right? I should have slapped. <laughs> You no, know, man, you we, know, we you, all have you, those you, moments, right? Yeah, you start with moments. your base, right? You're like, man, yeah, who's going to style better than me? Because I'm like, you know, I know, not that I'm, but I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty good with style. So not that, yeah. it, but just based on some of the other members that I saw, I yeah. really didn't see anybody that was super fashionable or that, that really put looks together and pattern matching. Mm -hmm. And man, this dude came in, man, he had the vest, he had, I mean, it was I mean, every color complimenting each other, and it, it came down to the heel of the skin tone, which is a big thing that we should learn as clothiers. When you're looking at your client, just really understanding what hues work best with certain skin tones, and he yeah. taught me that. I'm not taking credit. He taught me that. Um, but, you know, shadowing somebody like him uh, was huge, and, yeah, he's won that award twice, man. It was, it was, a, it was a, a world, you know, it was some of the best. It was maybe a dozen of the best clothiers in the world. Wow. And he won that award twice. I'm gonna have to check him out. I'm doing some research, bro. I already took my notes. I yeah, man. Replay I, this. I actually want to do something like this with him to speak on, you know, being a clothier. You know, what are some of his key takeaways as he's built his business over the last 20 years and being mm -hmm. one of the best in the business? He takes no shortcuts. Uh, it's bespoke. He doesn't make, you know, in our business, you know, if you do bespoke, you you do have a a, a major measure, um, you know, platform as well. Yeah, but, I mean, but those are his two main offerings, bespoke and made to measure. And I mean, even his try, he used some try ons on some stuff, man. Even that's so balanced that he could, he put me, I'm 39 chest, he put me in a 40, and obviously that fit well. He does a really high rope shoulder, mm. and it's like one of the most beautiful things you'll ever, you'll ever see. And then he put me in a 44, you know, so this is four sizes, yeah. Uh, and if you would have just, I wish I took a picture, if you'd have. Now, I looked a little big, but just how it still draped on me and how with a few tweaks, I could have made that work. Wow. I mean, he's like, there, I put so much time into balancing my models. So no matter who the client is, you know, it's 90% there before I even do anything. And that was just like, and I'm just soaking it all in. Man, I showed him a fit. And this was a couple of years ago. I showed him a fit of a, a bodybuilder I did. And I, and I was really happy. And I was... In my process, I hadn't had some tools that I needed to really fit this guy even better. But I didn't. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And I showed him, and he's just like, "Daryl, you got to refit this guy." And I was just like, "And we're having lunch." And I'm like, "I got to refit him." You know, like it's a wedding, and then you know, I'm like, "Okay." And I'm like, "Okay, yeah." But and he's just like, and he's just like pointing out, like, "Okay, we got to. You got to got to put another jacket on, and we got to do this. You got to pin it here." You know, you got to do this with guys that are built like him. And literally, I left it. When I left, I called him. I was like, hey, man, I got to get you back in when I'm back in town. You know, trust me. You know, I just, I, I want to make some tweaks to your pattern. You know, just, and he was a bodybuilder, big drop, you know, yeah. big arm. But, you know, the way I was going at it was just a lot different. But what it did was it, it changed how I looked at those bodybuilders who have the big arms, the big drop. And ever since I had that interaction and that feedback, which sometimes you get feedback, it's not going to be comfortable, but as long sure. as you learn from it, you know, it could pay dividends. And to this day now, you know, I'm so much more comfortable fitting these big bodybuilders with these big drops, all from what I learned from him. So, That's you know, amazing. but I had to be uncomfortable. I had to call that customer and say, hey, man, you know, I want to tweak a couple of things. And he was, and he was cool. You know, he but appreciated it. Yeah, I was going to say, I bet your customer, you know, in retrospect, really appreciate you coming back and saying, hey, man, there's 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 some things that we need to fix. Yeah, to make it look make you looking because obviously it's his day. So we want to make him look his best. Yeah. And by you being, you know, uh, honest in that high integrity, it was really important for you to go back. And, you know, he's going to tell his other bodybuilder friends like, hey, if yeah. you're the one that you want he already to work had. with, yep. it's you. Yep. Um, 
I wanted to answer one more question here. Uh, Surreal sure. Men uh, asks, you know, what, what types of organizations should beginners be a part of to learn more about the business? You know, you mentioned that you, uh, you participated in some things uh, um, in New York, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, are there any specific organizations that, you know, people should be looking towards uh, learning about? Yeah, you know, I, so I'm a member of the uh, Custom Tailor and Designer Association. Um, and that's where I said I obtained my certification. Okay. I said it's so they have new leaders every year, every two years. I've only been a member for maybe two, two and a half years. Um, I remember uh, talking to someone about it. They're like, oh, it's, it's a waste of time. You know, it's, um, you know, it's kind of stale, you know, this and that. And uh, so I pull them up online and I'm just, you know, and I, and I had someone that was a member as well. And they kind of gave me they, their feedback, but they have been in the business 30 years. So, excuse me, here it is. I'm coming in newer and I've just always been a sponge, man. If there's a place where I can learn information or I can meet people in the business, mm -hmm. I was flying there. I was there. It wasn't even a question. I tell my wife, hey, babe, I got I to gotta go to Chicago. They got this trade show. I'll be gone a couple of days. You yep. can go hang out or whatever. But that, again, when I'm in something, I'm all in. So uh, they told me about the organization. I saw they had just came out with kind of a, certi a certification for clothiers. Mm -hmm. It really piqued my interest because I was like, I didn't even know they had anything like that. You know, I'm just yeah. out here learning on my own. And that's so I, I signed up. I, I became a member like the next day. And then I signed up for three or four classes in New York. And I just started taking classes. And some of it was remedial information on fitting and stuff like yeah. that. You know, I knew, but people had questions that I'm like, oh, well, that's how they do that. That, you know, just whatever I could pick up. And it was up to me to ask questions to really expand um, upon my knowledge. But then, the biggest part is that is having at happy hour when I'm sitting next to one of the facilitators or, you know, picking their brain and say, Hey, would you ever mind, would you mind if I ever called you with a question mm -hmm. and just really working those angles. And, you know, they, man, people are a lot more um, giving than I think people get credit for. And so I did that. So they meet twice a year. I would go, you know, and I meet a few more people the next time I go. And now when I go, it's just like, you know, now when I'm sitting at the table, you know, people are coming up, and it's such a cool thing to just see how it evolves, how, like, you didn't know anybody. Yeah. And I can be in a room where I don't know anybody, and I can just start networking and stuff like that. But, you know, it's funny, after a couple of years, you know, you know, now you're knowing people, and then some of the younger guys that are coming into the organization, like, you know, and I got that personality where, you know, you can kind of draw people in and sure. kind of take them under your wing. You know, and now I'm like, all right, man, let's, let's you know, let's have dinner, let's meet, let's have some drinks. That way, you know, when we're in our circle and we're having fun, you know, we got so many season clothiers that are going to meet in the same spot. Hey, hey, John, come on over here. Let me introduce you to my guy from Texas and my guy from San Diego. And then before you know it, you know, now we got this synergy because, again, we're all in this together, man. If it's somebody yeah. in Austin that's not doing a great job at the business, he's not going to be around for long. And, yeah. on his, and on his way, he's going to burn some bridges because he's not going to be making stuff right. He's going to be pissing mm -hmm. people off. Yeah. So, you know, so I, I feel we're all in it together, and I'm more of a communal way of looking at it, which is not for everybody. A lot of people like to hold everything close to the best. Yeah. Which, you know, we got to hold some things, but I'm kind of on the other end because there's a, there's a young population, 25 to 35, that really want to get in this business. Mm -hmm. uh, they just don't know how. Exactly. You know, they don't have anybody to show them how to do it. Yep. And so actually, that's that's kind of a, an initiative of mine that I'm – that's a little project I'm going to be working on to kind of help bridge that because there's a, there's a lot of capable – and smart and successful people that especially now we got 40 million people unemployed yeah you know um people aren't, aren't afraid to be entrepreneurs so yep. you know i think there's a market out there for sure well that's what's up man you know i know i know we, we're getting close to our timeline so there's there's two, two things i wanted to do and uh, yeah. this is this is something that's kind of fun it's uh i call it the creative last supper right and um it's just a rapid fire you're gonna need to give me your answer okay uh, i think you'll like this so this is your last grade of supper, and these are the people you want to chop it up and eat with. Maxwell or John Legend? Uh, John Legend. Yves Saint Laurent or Alexander McQueen? Uh, Alexander McQueen. Wu Tang or Outcast? Ooh, Outcast. Jagged Edge or Jodeci? Jo oh, Jodeci. Ooh. I'm in that. Um, you know. That's you already know. <laughs> You already know. All right, Mary J. Blige or Sade? Oh, oh, um, I got Sade, man. Sade. You know, when I was painting with my dad, and I say he's playing James Brown and Frankie yep. Beverly, 
Uh, that Kiss of Life was in the background. All day. Um, Sade all day. And Anita Baker is another one of my yep. favorites. Anita. Anita. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Prince or Michael? Ah, oh, shit. Uh, Michael. All right. Um, Martin or Will? <sighs> Actor, Will. Comedy, back in the day, Martin. Got it. I don't that probably didn't answer, but yeah, that's a that's a good answer. That's that's yeah. what I would that's what I would say too. Um Oswald Botang or Tom Ford? Mmm. Ty. Ah, oh, that's a good one. We got um, Mahershala Ali or Chadwick Boseman. Uh Chadwick. Wesley or Denzel? Denzel. Beyonce or Rihanna? Ooh, Beyonce. She's a fellow Virgo. There you go. Uh, John Singleton or Spike Lee? Ooh. Probably John Singleton. Mm. That's a hard one, man. That's yeah, hard. man. But I'm going to go with John Singleton because that he's got some of my favorite movies. The but I was in the hood are always hard. Um, I respect Mike. Or, yeah, uh, I respect no. Spike. Spike. Um, Miles or Coltrane? Uh, Miles. He's from East St. Louis, baby. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. That All right. Okay. Home team. <laughs> Last question, because I know you got to go. I'm first, I want to say I appreciate you taking the time, spending this with yeah, me. It's been you. great. Yeah, man, it, it's been awesome. And I, hope, I definitely hope and pray that we We got to keep in touch, brother. Yeah, where, for, where are you out of? I'm right outside of D.C. in Maryland. Okay, nice. Yeah, yeah man, we're born and raised in South Carolina. I'm a country boy, man. It's kind to turn that, that country on. But, hey, that's, you do it well, brother. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, last question. Um, if you could spend 24 hours with any creative, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Mm. 24 hours yep. with any creative. Uh, man. There's a lot of people I like. Um, damn, that's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> well, give, well, give me one that you really wish that you could kind of chop it up with and really get some insight from. Uh, you know, I uh, Obama for me. There you go, Obama. I mean, I just you know I was thinking of someone who passed away, but I'm like, you know, I, I think it would just be cool, you know, just to kind of to hear him tell his story, you know, just just over the last few years of just you know America's changing every day. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, I, I think that would be cool. You know, I, I think it'd be cool to shoot some baskets with them. You know, give oh, yeah, them, that's right. You got give give them a good ten piece on the basketball side. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think that'd be cool. That's what's up, man. Well, I appreciate your time, man. I want to thank everyone for showing up. Yeah, thank um, you. you. You've been a gentleman and a scholar, and I wish everyone an amazing evening. And I look forward to seeing you here at the Style Jumper and Jump School. If you want to see what I'm wearing on a day-to-day -day basis, check out my Instagram. There you'll find a ton of looks that maybe you can choose from, or at least get some inspiration. Hope you enjoyed today's video, and if you have any questions or suggestions, leave it in the comments below. We'll see you next time.